Hi everyone, this is Jen and you're watching BPD Woman. In today's video, you're going to learn tips for dealing with grief. And I'm not just talking about grief that comes with the passing of a loved one or an animal, but I'm talking about grief that comes from the loss of something important to you like a relationship. Aside from dealing with grief, we're gonna give you some tips on looking at patterns in your past relationships where this grief may come from. I'm also going to give you an examination on the comparison between trauma bonds, um, former relationship patterns, and how those affect where you are as an adult today. Well, if that all sounds good to you, let's get going. Again, my name's Jen and you're watching BPD Woman. Help me out. Would you hit like, share, subscribe, comment for me below? The button is just right there. Um, doing so will help me get these videos pushed out and help more people that are in need of this kind of information. And I tailor my videos to those of us dealing with BPD, CPTSD, and those who feel they are highly emotional or sensitive persons that have difficulty regulating emotions. I offer positive solution solution-based approaches to recovery, focusing on my own therapeutic experience, which has spanned the last 20 years of my diagnosis, although I believe I have lived with borderline for the last 30. I have done several, several rounds of DBT, in-person, group, one-on-one -on -one therapies, I've read books, I've done workbooks, I stay on top of trends and research, and I look at all kinds of things, and then I gather that all up, and I share it with you. And while I am not a psychologist or a DBT specialist, I can answer one question that most of those folks cannot, which is, what is it like to live with borderline? And in doing so, I offer you an insight and nuances that your therapist just can't provide because they just don't live and breathe this every day. But I do recommend that you get one and you stick with the program. Today, we are going to be talking about grief. And this comes from another video viewer. And so thank you. Um, I, I did a, every several months, I'll put out a short video asking for your video suggestions. So if you ever have a video suggestion, you can drop me a comment um, below, or you can email me at womanbpd at gmail.com. That's W-O-M-A-N-B-P-D at gmail.com. This um, great suggestion, and all of these suggestions have been great, and so thank you very much. Um, I'm going to read what uh, this subscriber and viewer uh, requested. Hi, Jen, and this is from Wandering Nowhere. Hello, Wandering Nowhere, he says, or she says. Excuse me. Hi, Jen, have you discussed about grief before? Not necessarily when someone dies, but when it comes to losing people you wanted to keep in your life. I am still obsessing over one person and losing my mind nearly two years on. Any new situation I'm in, I keep thinking about them because they, at one time, understood and were supportive in a way no one else has. I wish that I could forget it all. Well, thank you so much for your honesty and for your um, sharing this with all of us. Um, I've definitely found myself in a position like this and I think that um, I can offer you some insights. So um, first, you know, let's talk about grief. You know, what is it? Well, grief obviously is dealing with a deep loss. And I think that's sort of the easiest way that you can kind of put a short label on it is, you know, we deal with grief when we someone moves away, um, when a pet dies, when a person passes away. And those types of grief are a little bit different because it's very final, right? Uh, with death, you know, um, there's no making amends. There's no trying to get them back in your life. You know, there's no more see you next week. So there's never really a chance to have a reconciliation. But when it comes to a relationship or a situation that is a deep loss, right? Whether that's because you decided to end it or they've ended it or they don't want to speak with you anymore or you've lost your job or whatever the case may be. Um, it's, it's different because they're still alive. And so in some ways, at least I've said to myself, well, you know, if someone passes away, like there's nothing I can do about that anymore. But when someone's still alive, at least in my mind, my mind goes to how can I fix this? How can I fix this? Right? 
And there's a lot of things that I want to unpack um, from this message. So first, let me say that I have experienced um, this type of grief before, wandering nowhere. And I have, um, and I will share that experience. But before we get there, I'm just going to unpack this a little bit. Um, a couple of things that I pick out of this is the obsession and the rumination. And that's something that I, I have dealt with many, I mean, even still sometimes. I think that, you know, I still have ruminated ruminating thoughts and sometimes I can get obsessed about thinking about something. I just think now the difference is, is that I've developed um, more effective coping mechanisms in dealing with that. And so that rumination is a tough one. And, you know, the mind thinks that, well, if we just keep thinking about it, we'll be able to figure it out. If we just think about it again, we can maybe figure this out. And and sort of the, the mind trap is that if you keep ruminating and kicking it on your brain that it's somewhere in all of that ruminating, you may come up with a solution. You won't. In fact, the best thing that you can do is to give your mind a break and distract on something else. Sort of like when you're studying for vital exams or something like that. And, you know, you're just hitting it, hitting it, hitting it. At a certain point, your brain is like, okay, I've had too much. I need to go do something else. And that, that just has proven to be a more effective way of learning by taking breaks and giving your mind a break. So I've had, I have a very popular video, um, out of my videos anyway, and it's, it's about obsessive rumination. And so please check that out again, or if you haven't checked it out, it could be very helpful when it comes to the obsession and the, in the rumination. Um, also note the um, length of time. So Wandering Nowhere says it's been two years, right? And there's definitely no time limit for grief. You know, sometimes you may go a day and not think about it at all. Um, I have been in situations where, you know, and about the person I'm going to speak about, I have like only stopped thinking about them when I was in a relationship with someone else. And then several years went by and then I rarely think about them very much anymore. And so two years is, it's all relative, you know? So I know two years may seem like a long time and in your mind, you're like, when is this going to go away? When is this going to subside? And there is just no answer. Um, so it may be a little bit less sometimes. Um, it may be a little bit more. And and one of the DBT skills, it, you know, with emotion is not holding on to an emotion for very long, but also not keeping it at bay. And the kind of analogy is that, you know, you think of emotions as waves. One comes in, one goes out. One comes in, one goes out. And you're trying not to get caught up in the wave which is an analogy to becoming dysregulated by your emotions. So um, finally, this last part is um, about the grief because this, the wandering nowhere saying, I keep thinking about them because at one time they were really supportive and understood me in a, in a way no one else has. I wish I could forget it all. So that's, that's sort of even a deeper right pain is that like somebody that you felt really got you somebody that you felt really understood you someone that you maybe opened up to in a way that you've never opened up to anyone someone who knew all of your stuff it can be very difficult because now not only are you missing that person and that relationship but now you're also missing that outlet and that connection and that ability to be like, I did the eye blinking thing again, and they're the only person that knows what the eye blinking thing is, right? It's like, oh, now I got to start over and explain all of this to someone else. And so I get all of that. So let me stop there. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how I dealt with the situation. And then we're going to kind of unpack that. And I'm going to point out some things that I think could be helpful. Let's go. So the first thing I want to say is that I'm not sure how long... Um, wandering nowhere has known this person. I don't know if it was a romantic relationship or a friendship or family member. I don't know how long they were together or not together. The point is, is that the length of time that you know someone is important for some reasons I'm gonna to name. However, one of 
the situation I'm about to tell you, I only knew this person about two, three months and the connection was so deep and so profound, at least I thought it was, we're going to talk about that, so deep and so profound and I had so many hopes and dreams with this person who communicated, we matched each other, you know, with our sharing, um, that I was devastated for years years. I tried getting this person back many times. They blocked um, my email. I sent them a handwritten letter. I mean, I was really fucked up about this. So, you know, and people would be like, well, oh, how long did you date? And it's like, well, what does that matter? I mean, like, you could be married to somebody for five years and not feel close to them at all. And then you could meet someone and know them for two months and, you know, really know everything about that person. So that's, in so far as building up an emotional connection, the length of time, I'm not concerned about. Um, I still, I think you should get to know someone over a, a period of time, and people only really reveal themselves truly over, a, you know, a extended period of time. But that's not to say that you can't develop like a quick kinship or friendship or love for somebody very quickly, depending on how deep it is. If that's healthy or not, that's a different question. But it it is possible. So I was on a dating website years and years ago and um, I, he just reached out to me and basically like that, we were kind of inseparable till the day that we broke up. And um, a long story short, I was about to move out of my apartment and go into another apartment. I had it all um, settled. We started dating pretty hot and heavy like our first date lasted four days <laughs> so we had this date he came back to my house um then I went to his house and I brought my dogs and I mean we were just like Woof. I mean it was just like one of those like love at first sight things do I believe in love at first sight I don't I think love and first sight is uh chemistry um and sometimes what you're attracted to is not healthy for you you know kind of like drugs, right? You know, you may feel like this intense urge for drugs. You may feel an intense high off drugs, but they're not good for you. They're not healthy. So, um, it was really hot and heavy. And he said, and he lived about 60 miles away from where I lived. And he said, well, if you're moving, why don't you just come and move, live with me? And I said, oh my God, I was like, this is crazy. This is crazy. Like even the day that we were moving my stuff, from my place into his, we kind of got in an argument and I was like, and I said out loud, I was like, this is a mistake. And he was like, oh. I mean, he told me he loved me first. He told me he loved me like within four days. Um, and he was very supportive. He came to a therapy session, you know, I told him about my diagnosis, which is not something that I had really done with people before. Um, he wanted to know, he started reading a book and then the reality kind of set in, right? And by, and by the way, along the way, we're talking about having kids and we're talking about getting married. And then sort of the reality started to set in a bit. And um, the reality was, was that I have BPD. And at that time, I hadn't really gone through a DBT course um, in a number of years. And I was not in a great interpersonal place. Um, I was sober, but I just wasn't really making solid relationship decisions. And even for me, for someone who has sort of always rushed into relationships, even this one felt very rushed. So I'm living there and after about a month, so I've made this whole move. I've moved 60 miles. I've moved all my stuff in. And after a month, he goes, well, I want to keep dating you, but I don't think living together is working out. So I'll give you a few weeks, but you have to move out. And I was like, what? Um, and I was like, well, if I move out, I don't see how we're going to continue to date. And um, he was like, oh, no, no, yeah. Um, yes, we will. And he was like really upset that I had said that. And I was like, how could you be surprised that I, you're basically kicking me out after I've uprooted everything. I've given up this apartment. This apartment is gone. And now you want me to leave. 
So um, he's like, no, no, I promise we're gonna like work things out and everything's gonna be good. And um, the date that I moved, like that the movers came, he decided that that was the day that he would break up with me. Yeah. And um, I was devastated. And obviously it was a really shitty fucking unbrave thing for him to do. Like, oh, you're gonna break up with me while the movers are here? And they're on the clock. Like, I don't know. Did he think, like, um, like, you know, how out of touch with, like, manners and decency do you have to be to break up with somebody during moving day? Like, what? Okay, whatever. So, um, needless to say, there was, there was some other things that happened along the way. And we didn't get back together. And I remember just being in the shower one day, feeling like there was a floor in my stomach and that it had dropped out. And I cried from a place that was just angst and loss and emptiness, shame. And um, I, I tried to get him back by saying things like, I'll do better, you know, I'll be better. Um, I promise, like, I'm going to get more help. And he didn't want to hear it. And, you know, he could, he said some not nice things to me as well. And, and again, you know, no one person is responsible for everything in a relationship. That's just not how life works, okay? So I was devastated. And I obsessed and I thought about this guy for years. And this was back in 2016. So this is five, five years later now. I, he's not really in my thought process anymore. But even up until two years ago, three years ago, I was like, you know, I was like thinking about him or I'd look him up online. And then over time, through therapy, through reading articles, through watching other people's YouTube channels, I came to the realization that perhaps he was a bit narcissistic. And perhaps he was just as emotionally dysregulated and unstable as I was. I mean, think about it. You invite somebody to come live with you after knowing them a few weeks. Um, you tell somebody to move in and then you kick them out a month later. Um, you say that you're going to support them, but then you get 10 pages into a book and you stop reading. Because as you said, as he said to me, I don't need to read that book. I live with borderline every day. What? what a fucking asshole thing is that to say? But at the time, I didn't think it was a shitty asshole thing to say. I thought like, oh yeah, he's right. And then later in therapy, you know, my DBT counselor, she was just mortified. She was like, that is a really mean thing to say, Jen. And I was like, is it? And she's like, yes. So... Over time, the way that I began to unpack this was for years, I thought in my head, the narrative was, he's perfect, we were meant to be, I fucked all this up, how can I get him back, right? Those were the things. But then over time, I began to realize more and more that I was really focused on the fantasy instead of the reality. And so this is the first part in dealing with grief is that being fixated on the woulds and coulds and mites and how it could be and how you talk about things um, that will be in the future. Some people call this future faking. The promises that we're going to get married, that you're going to live here, I'm going to love you, we're going to, all this other stuff. I'm going to move in with him. That is all great to talk about, but I mean, the proof is in the pudding, which means that you know, <laughs> money talks and bullshit walks. So you either put up or you shut up. And so saying all those things is very romantic, but when you actually put them into motion, that's a bit more difficult. So the first thing was that, and I offered this um, next suggestion I'm gonna give in, in one of my videos called um, uh, the, BP, the BPD NPD relationship trap. And I made several lists. Um, about what I wanted out of the relationship and what I got. I made lists about what he promised me and what he actually did. I made lists about how I wanted to feel and how I ended up feeling. 
And within these lists, you're going to find that there could be some similarities, but oftentimes you're going to find that there are huge dissonances and disconnects in these lists. For instance, he said, I want to marry you. I'm committed to you. I love you. Now get out of my house. Okay. Um, I want to support you with Borderline. I'm going to um, read this book. He came to one session and he read 10 pages of a book and that was it, right? So the dissonance. So looking at that helps you sort of start to like unburden yourself of the responsibility that you did everything wrong because that is our go-to, right? If you have borderline, you, you feel a lot of shame. You've been taught that you can't trust your perceptions out of a, an environment of invalidation that you grew up with. And now you really have a hard time trusting your judgment. And so obviously you must be the problem because you always were. Okay. So making these lists starts to break down and help you see that I didn't really do all of this stuff. This wasn't really all me. So I like to call that putting it on paper. All right. Um, the second thing here is that and I'm just looking at some notes. Um, while you're trying to gain perspective on the relationship, you want to check the facts of that relationship. For me, I thought this guy was committed and he loved me and that we were going to be together and that he would live up to his promises. Like he said things like, my relationships are more important to me than um, my job. Well, that wasn't true. His job actually, he chose his job essentially over me. So when you check the facts, and this is another DBT skill, when you're feeling really emotionally dysregulated, for instance, I caused him to run away from me. Well, okay, sure. I, you know, my emotional instability, some of the other things that I may have done, of course, contributing factors. However, there were also things that he said he was going to do that he didn't. And when you begin to check these facts, again, this sort of goes back into the putting it on paper exercise. You unburden yourself from some of the responsibility that you had everything to do with this. And why we do that is so that we gain a better perspective and a more clear perspective about owning what's what, right? Because remember, with our black and white thinking, we have a tendency to idolize or devalue. We, You know, you're either... The, the the goddess of our world or you're a piece of shit and I've blocked you forever. Well, ni neither of those is actually true. It's always somewhere in the gray zone or what I like to call gray zone thinking. The third thing that I like to, to point out is, again, recognizing the trauma bonds. And again, in my BPD, NPD relationship trap video, I talked a lot about what the trauma bond is. And I talked a lot about why those of us with BPD may end up with certain relationship types than others. And it, and I recommend that you take a look at that video to go into more about trauma bonds. And I will produce a longer video just specifically on trauma bonds. But you wanna look at the situation clearly through a trauma bond lens and you wanna ask yourself, is this a traumatically bonded relationship? Is this actually healthy? Does this criteria of my relationship match up with the criteria criteria that I have been reading about with trauma bonds. Why you want to do this is first of all, because trauma bonds are not healthy. And second of all, you want to make sure you're not romanticizing your situation. That relationship that I described to you, where we moved in after three weeks and he told me he loved me right away. And our first date lasted four days and I moved in. That's all very romantic, but is it realistic, right? Then after you think about the trauma bond, the fourth thing that I want you to ask yourself is, where have I seen this pattern before? Oftentimes things that happen to us as adults that are extremely painful have been rooted in our past in something that was equally traumatic, if not more so. Sort of like I have a knee injury, right? I had an ACL surgery five, six years ago, five years ago. And um, every now and then, it hurts. Um, every now and then I may be jumping off a curb or I may like do a squat the wrong way and ugh, my knee hurts, right? It's because I was wounded five years ago. But even now in, in the present day, long after the surgery and the rehab, 
I still have pain. And the same is true of your emotional wounds. And so you want to look at patterns and say, okay, why does my knee hurt? Okay, well, I know why my knee hurts. That's an obvious one. But why do I miss this person so much? You know, what was it about this connection? And you may find that it was very healthy or you may not. But oftentimes when this type of grief is really rooted deeply in us, it has to do with something else. So think about it. Did someone leave you when you were young? Were your parents there, but not really there for you? You know, were you silenced a lot? Did this person give something to you that you didn't get from others, right? You want to look at where you may have seen this before, because that's honestly at the heart, most likely, of where this deep pain or abandonment feeling may come from. And for me, it would be an abandonment. I just want to belong to something. I want to belong to someone. I want a family. I don't have a family. So with the person I was describing about this guy that I was dating, he could have represented the building of a new family. I could be in his family with his mom and his dad and his brother and his sister-in-law. And then that got taken away from me. And that was another like, oh, no, I don't have this either, right? Um, and finally, I would say, in dealing with this, is, is making amends. This is my final tip. Making amends, but first for you and then for them. I had it the opposite way back in 2015 or 16, whenever I was dating this guy. Or I don't even know. Maybe it was 2014. I don't know. But... I was like always apologizing to him. I was always quick to point out all of the bad stuff I did. I was like, well, if I do this, you'll come back to me. Like, let me shape shift. Let me do whatever. Let me be whatever you need me to be. Okay. What I would like to have told that person way back then, me, is that why don't you forgive yourself? Why don't you be gentle with yourself for a while? Why don't you give yourself a hug? Why don't you promise to yourself that you're going to make it better for you first? then make amends with the other person. Now, sometimes people don't want to hear from you anymore and you're going to have to respect that boundary, right? You don't want to turn, you know, obsessiveness can turn into stalking when it really tips over the edge. So you want to make amends and try to work on the best you as possible. Then you can think about going back to the other person and making amends if they're willing to hear you. And I will tell you that there have been many relationships that I've made amends and we've been able to move on. And then there have been some that people are like, I don't want to ever talk to you again. Okay, well, that's fine. Cause there have been people where I've been like, I don't ever want to talk to you again. Last thing I want to say here is that grief is difficult. It's multifaceted. It, sometimes you, you don't even think about the person that day. And then other times, you know, maybe around like a, a specific event, like an anniversary or a holiday, you may think about them more and more. But using these skills, I hope that I've named out for you and allowing time to heal all wounds. And I do think with work, time plus therapy does heal all wounds. I'm hoping that the grief will become lessened and that you can sort of move on from there. My name is Jen. You've been watching BPD Woman. Please like, share, subscribe. If you have a comment or a question or a video suggestion, email me w-o-m-a-n-b-p-d at gmail.com. Until I see you next time in everything you do, please be effective. Bye-bye.